going to turn um, our minds and our hearts to the Word of God for a little bit. And today, it's going to feel like a complicated subject, but we're going to look at Ezekiel and the Temple of God. But if you bear with me, um, I think that everyone in this room can glean information from this from this message. Um, it's something that I continue to go back to to get as much information as possible. So just a little beginning, a little intro. Ezekiel was a prophet of God. Uh, I think most of us understand that. And as a prophet of God, he was a voice piece for the creator, for Yahweh, his God. And a voice that would deliver terrifying judgment, the terrifying judgment of God on his people, Israel, on one hand, and then in the other hand, an incredible blessing and promise to the future for even us. So he used Ezekiel as a tool in this way. And to those who would fear and obey God, he represented God, God's kindness. But to those who would fall away from God, God's severity. I think you might notice that reference to Romans there where Paul uses a similar image. And with Ezekiel, many of the messages that we, that we read there, good and bad, revolve around the temple of God. There's tons of information about the temple of God in the book of Ezekiel. So today we're going to go, we're going to look at where and how God has chosen to place his glory or to dwell and what happens when he takes that glory or his blessing away and a time where God himself ultimately will live with his people here on this earth. So first, as always, and those of you who have sat through enough of Keith's classes, you know what's coming. It's a timeline. And I find that it's always incredibly important to be able to place the people that we're talking about scripturally in time. Because if we can't, then we can't relate to what's happening to them, and we remove ourselves from the message. Okay? So the great thing, or one of the greatest things, and those of you who have done a lot of study in the scripture, you probably recognize this. Ezekiel's amazing for building timelines. The man wrote down or stated what year all of these things happened to him, not by giving you the year BC, because that's not how he would say things, but he'd say in the year of this thing. Usually it was in the blank year of Jehoiakim's captivity. So we see here that in the year 597 BC, Ezekiel was taken in the second overturning of, it, of Jerusalem by Babylon to these settlements by the river Kibar. Chibar, Kibar, whichever way. You can see it on the map. I'm not going to hold to the map being 100% accurate, but just to give you an idea, it's over in modern day mm, Iraq or Kuwait, somewhere in there. Okay? And he was taken in that second overturning in 597 and lived there removed from his home, removed from his family. Anyways, not far down the road, he receives his first vision from God, his commissioning from God, that he was going to be someone that was going to receive these visions and be a voice to the people for him. Then in 592, I think that's only about seven years, or I can't do math, guys, four, five, six, six to seven years before the next event, Ezekiel gets lifted up in a vision, says it lifts him up by his hair, and it takes him to Jerusalem, and God shows him the temple, the temple in Jerusalem that's still standing in 592, and shows him the abominations that are happening there, the reason that these things are happening to him and to God's people, okay? And then in 586, we see that temple come to an end because of those things that Ezekiel was shown in 592. Okay, and that's the third overturning of Babylon coming down, and then they haul off the remainder of the Judea, well, remainder, enough of the Judeans to call it the remainder and take them captive and for, for the rest of the 70 year captivity. So in 573, we see a message of hope because up to this point for Ezekiel, it's been pretty bad, it's been dark. And in 573, we get a vision of a future temple, along with visions of restoration of Israel as a nation. Okay, so before we dive into the text in Ezekiel, we need to have an understanding of what the temple is and what service it was going to do for the people. 
Okay. So for that, oh, and just so you guys know, um, I will quite often when reading in the Old Testament, take all caps L-O-R-D and read Yahweh for that, especially when I think it needs to be emphasized that we are talking about the one true God specifically. Other times I'll read Lord because we're rolling through stuff. But when you read that, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that Ezekiel believed in and was receiving visions from. Okay. So about 400 years before Ezekiel, about loosely, we have an event, the prophet Nathan coming to David. David, God's friend, the king that he chose of Judah to be king over Israel, over all of Israel, a united Israel, was thinking about building God a house to replace the tabernacle that he, that he had been had his presence in since the time they came out of Egypt. And he wanted to build God a, a proper dwelling place, okay? So he says that he's gonna do these things and God sends Nathan to David. And in 2 Samuel 7, we read what Nathan says to him, to David. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He will, he, sorry, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Two things here. One, you see things in color. And for those of you who enjoy playing fun little mind games, I want you to keep track of all the colors as you go through because I can't talk about all the details that there are in these messages in the 40 minutes that we have to present it. But I've highlighted things that I find very interesting and they're not all inclusive. Like there's other things in these texts that you can find, but if you follow the colors through, there's a message there that God has presented for us. But in this entire text, we see David desiring to build this house and Nathan saying, you're not gonna do it. David was told he had too much blood on his hands to build the temple. But a descendant would come up after him and would do it. And this happens multiple times. Okay, and we're going to talk about two of those times today that a descendant of David would rise up and build the house of the Lord. Okay, so our next text is about 40 years later. And this is in approximately 957 BC. And this is the first time that this prophecy is partially fulfilled. And it's fulfilled through Solomon. And we read in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. Now when Solomon, this is, at, this is the dedication of the temple. He's already started, he's already built it. And now they're dedicating it to the Lord. Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of Yahweh filled the house. The priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. All the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, truly, he is good. Truly, his loving kindness is everlasting. In order for it to be a house that God was going to dwell in, he had to bestow his glory, his spirit upon that house. If you know the history of the tabernacle, he did the same thing there. So God showing here that he's satisfied with what Solomon built, he puts his glory into that house. And thus, from that moment until it stops, God is dwelling with his people Israel in this house. Okay, you notice the pinks, and we've added a third color with the blue. <coughs> right after the dedication of this temple, Solomon's told some important information. It's similar information to what Moses got when he received the law. It's actually almost the exact same information, worded differently, but it's there. And I have it titled, If Then Blessings. You do these things then I'll bless you. So we read in 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 18. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place 
for myself as a house of sacrifice. God chose the place. Yahweh chose the place. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and will heal their land. If then. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive, attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, even to do according to all that I have commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne, as I covenanted with your father David, saying, you shall not lack a man to be ruler in Israel. Incredible blessings, not only to the temporal life of Solomon and his direct lineage that would come to be true, that the line of Judah would sit on the throne during the, the entire reign of the empire of Judah, but looking back to what was promised to David, a recall of what was promised to David in our first reference, of the descendants that would rule forever. We all know that Solomon didn't rule forever. We understand that. So we have to be looking to a time where a descendant of David, a descendant of Solomon, will reign forever. I love this text because it shows that God chooses the place that he's going to place his spirit, put his spirit, and that he's gonna work from there and communicate with his people and they were his. They were his chosen people, his chosen house. But there's a follow-up. And if you notice, this text is right after the last. If then blessings are followed by if then cursings, just like it was with Moses, just like it was when they came into the land with Joshua. So in 2 Chronicles 7, we continue reading at verse 19. And that word, but, here it is. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve gods and worship them, then I will uproot you from my land, which I have given you, and this house, which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and a byword among all the nations or all peoples. As for this house, which was exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this, this land and to this house? And they will say, because they forsook Yahweh, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they adopted other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this adversity upon them. This is 400 years before the time that we're going to read in Ezekiel. And there were times in between now, this time, when Solomon's receiving this, and 586, when the temple is destroyed, there were times that both if-then blessings and if-then cursings happened. We know that in 722, the northern 10 tribes of Israel were taken away by the kingdom of Assyria because of this, because they left the God that their fathers worshiped when they came out of Egypt and they signed up for that covenant agreement, signed up for those promises. So we need to be able to see the times that God blesses his people and the times that God curses his people and know what they're tied to. They're tied all the way back to the beginning to the promises that he delivered to Abraham from the get-go. I'm hitting next. 
and it's not moving. Oh, okay. So, how'd they do? And we're gonna, speci we're gonna specifically talk about Judah today, because we don't have all the time in the world. Judah is what became the southern end of the two nations once they split, when the other 10 tribes took off to the north, or had their land to the north, and started their own kingdom with the Jeroboam and Rehoboam scenario. Judah was the one that the throne was going to be tied to, right? We talked about that with David. We talked about that with Solomon. The descendant would come from that line. So we're going to focus on Judah, and we're going to look at an event. We're going to look at a ruler. But there were multiple kings in the line of Judah that didn't do well, that didn't uphold their end of the deal, that fell to the if-then cursings. There were kings that upheld their end of the deal and partook in the if-then blessings. But about 13 generations after Solomon and about 80 years now before Ezekiel, we have a king in Judah, and his name is Manasseh. He's the son of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, who was a righteous king, documented as a righteous king. And he has his son, and his son takes over his reign when he dies upon Hezekiah's death. And we're going to read about Manasseh. And in 2 Chronicles 33, we're going to start here with 1 through 9 and then move on to the next slide says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord disposed before the sons of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. He also erected altars for the Baals and made Asherim, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. He built altars inside the house of Yahweh, of which the Lord had said, My name shall be in Jerusalem forever. For he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of Yahweh. How much is this leaning into the if-then cursings portion of what we read. He's not only worshiping other gods and leaving Yahweh to worship these gods, he's now moving those things into the house of his God. The, the God that brought them up out of the land of Egypt. He's building the idols and putting them in there. After God told them, my name shall be in Jerusalem forever, in this house, in this dwelling place. He also made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, and he practiced witchcraft, used divination, practiced sorcery, and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger. Then he put the carved image of the idol which he had made in the house of God of which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen. From all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed to your fathers, if, there's that word again, if only they will observe to do all that I have commanded them according to all the law the statutes and the ordinances which I gave through Moses. Thus, Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. If there is a bad report card to bring home, Manasseh's hit the mark. The beginning of this, he passed his sons through the fire. From the very beginning, God told them how he felt about child sacrifice or human sacrifice. 
And that was something that was practiced in the land when they came into the land. And it stayed there, and Manasseh fell to it. Amongst these other things, witchcraft, divination, sorcery, medium, spiritus, the list is just, it's intense. The number of things that he was doing and leading the people of Judah to do. And this is, what I say, 13 generations, 13 generations down the line. From the time that God blessed that temple and put his spirit in it. In front of them all, and they all bowed down and said, we believe and will and we'll obey. Now it's important at this point to realize that, yes, as bad as Judah had got, that we're faithful. And that's an important message. It's an important message for us because we look at our time period and we go, wow, the world's getting really bad. Not sure if it's to this yet for us individually, but the world's getting bad. And we have to live in it. And we have to serve Yahweh in that world. And it's important to see here that, yes, while it says that Manasseh misled Judah, it could be very easy to think, oh, well, he, like everybody, was doing it. But that brings us to Manasseh's grandson. Manasseh's son himself was not a good man. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. But his grandson was a man named Josiah. And Josiah was about as good of a report card as you could get. He went through and he knocked down all those idols and he removed the idols from the house of the Lord. And he went to rebuild the house of the Lord, like remodel, not model, but like fix it up and get it back to what it should have been. In that act, Hilkiah found the book of the law and then Josiah read the book of the law or had it read to him at least, understood it and said, we need to get back on track. And he did so many things in his life to get it back on track and to try to bring Judah back into the if then blessings category, the category that we all want to be in. If I do this, I'll receive the blessings. And Josiah lived his life attempting to do that. He wasn't alone. That's when Jeremiah was prophesying. He was working with him. You had Amos and Hosea, uh, or sorry, I'm wrong. You didn't have those guys. I'm just spouting. Uh, he had other prophets that were working along, along the line. People that, I mean, Daniel's alive during this time period. You have Ezekiel coming into the picture in this time period. People were there, and they were working for Yahweh, okay? The problem is, is that the bad had already been done. And God already told them in the if-then cursings what would happen if they did those things. And they'd done them. So this, title, this slide is titled, The Bad Outweighs the Good. And in 2 Kings 23 here, we read, Before him, or Josiah, there was no king like him who turned to Yahweh with all his heart and with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Nor did any like him arise after him. That's an A-plus report card. However, Yahweh did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger burned against Judah because of all of the provocations with, with which Manasseh had provoked him. The Lord said, I will remove Judah. Remember he said, I will uproot them if they do these things. I will remove Judah also from my sight as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off Jerusalem, this city which I have chosen, and the temple of which I said my name shall be there. So they would succumbed to the if-then cursings. They did those things, and he said, it's too late. It's going to happen you're going to be removed just like Israel, the northern ten tribes were removed before you. And then this city, this house that I said I'd be in, we're at the then 
of the cursings. I'm going to remove myself from it. Another text about uh, Josiah. But to the king of Judah, Josiah, who sent you to inquire of Yahweh, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, sorry, I lost it, and, and you humbled yourself before Yahweh, when you heard what I spoke against the inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. So they brought word back to the king. So, yes, Josiah did all these great things, and God recognizes that behavior. And he allows Josiah to die before he would witness the falling of Judah. He goes to his grave in peace. He isn't the one that has to witness it. They weren't going to lose the kingdom and God's dwelling place under Josiah's reign. In fact, it would be under one of his son's reign. Because he has two sons that reign and then a grandson. And the grandson is Jehoiakim, the one that we read about at the beginning of this right, that Ezekiel went to captivity with. And then his last son, Mataniah, or Zedekiah, is the final king of Judah. Okay? And they all did evil in the sight of the Lord. So, I know that at the beginning of this slide it said Ezekiel and the temple of God, and we really haven't read a single text from Ezekiel. We're there now. But I think it's important for us to know, in order to understand what happens to Ezekiel, we have to know what's living in the temple. God placed his glory, his spirit within that temple. He anointed that temple with his spirit. And that was him dwelling with the people. Okay? So, in 592, this is that 592 vision. This is seven years before the fall of the temple the destruction of the temple. Ezekiel is living by the river Kibar, and he's caught up by his hair, it says, and taken in vision to the temple, and these are the abominations that he's going to see. God is going to show him what's happening in the temple. And remember, this is generations after Manasseh, and, and uh, Josiah cleaned it up, and this is where it is after that, by the time his third son hits the throne. Okay. He stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by the lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court of the temple, okay? Where the seat of the idol of jealousy, sorry, where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy, was located. So someone has placed idols back in the temple at this point. After Josiah had them removed, they're back. Okay? And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there. He was still at the temple. Like the appearance which I saw on the plain, then he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes not toward the north, now toward the north. So I raised my eyes toward the north, and behold, to the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here, so that I would be far from my sanctuary. But yet, you will still see greater abominations. So he takes him further in, and he said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here? that they have filled the land with violence and provoked me repeatedly? For behold, they are putting the twig to their nose. Therefore, I indeed will deal in wrath. My eyes will have no pity, nor will I spare. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not listen to them. It had hit the boiling point. 
God was done with what Judah was doing. The prophecies given by Jeremiah years before in the 23rd year of Josiah that they would go into captivity for 70 years that had already partially been fulfilled. Remember, Ezekiel's in the second one of those captivities. He's been taken. Daniel was taken in 605, 606, and then Ezekiel in 597. And now we're coming up to this vision about what's going to happen. It's all coming to be the way God said it would if they didn't obey. Then the glory of Yahweh departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. When the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight and the wheel, with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of God, of the God of Israel, hovered over them. This vision is far more complex than the text that I'm pulling out of it. But the point is, is that the glory of God removed itself from the temple. Okay? And we see that in the image. That he's being shown the abominations that are happening, and this is the result. God's glory, his living with them, is leaving that place. Leaving that temple. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of, God, of the God of Israel hovered over them. The glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. It was leaving. It wasn't going to be in Judah and Jerusalem anymore because God's people in general weren't there anymore. He'd had people taken captive. Conveniently so, they were to the east. It would make sense that his spirit went with the people that were in the east with Ezekiel and those people there. I know that Jeremiah ends up staying in the land and trying to work there with much difficulty. But we see that spirit depart from the house, and it's a direct result of their behavior, their lack of obedience. Okay, it's been really depressing so far, guys, so we're working on it. <laughs> right, I told you, severity and kindness, that's what Ezekiel is presented with. And that's what he presents to the people. It's what he has. And that's what God is showing us. Both sides. So, later in the, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, we're not going to read the whole vision. We're shown a future restoration of God's people. Israel, or at this point in the text, we read Ephraim and Judah, brought back together to be a united Israel again. And in Ezekiel 37, after that, we see, My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. And they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. And they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons, forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. You notice that it's yellow. I hope that we're paying attention to some of the colors. It's not, it's not that David has to be there himself, but that descendant from David can rule there. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever my sanctuary, my house, in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst. So Ezekiel is showing this vision of the, of the nations, his people being brought back together and being ruled under one shepherd, a descendant of David. He's shown this. And if we look at history, we have not seen this. So this is future time even to us. And once his dwelling place is with them again, it will be forever this time. Then he's shown an amazing set of chapters, 40 through 42 in Ezekiel. He's walked through in vision a new temple. 
and shown all the amazing things within the new temple. And in an effort not to read three chapters of Ezekiel, that's what those parts are about. And where we pick it up in 43, 1 through 7, we see, we said, Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing to the east. And behold, the glory of God, sorry, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east. Remember, it departed to the east. It's coming back from the east. And his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when he came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kibar, and I fell on my face. And the glory of Yahweh came into the house, this new house, this new temple, by the way of the gate facing toward the east. And the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. Then I heard one speaking to me from the house while a man was standing beside me. He said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. And the house of Israel will not again defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings by their harlotry and by the corpses of the kings when they die. This time, there is no if-then cursings with God's people and with his dwelling place. And with this vision we receive the good news, the good things to come. For Ezekiel, Israel, and all who are obedient. In Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, we see, Then say to him, thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch, or the Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of Yahweh, the house of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. The one that builds the temple will rule from the throne. That ties us straight back to that prophecy given from Nathan to David, that it would be one of David's descendants that will build the throne, or sorry, the temple, and rule from that throne. Completing, starting to complete this picture. Then we read in Revelation 20, 4, part 1 and 6. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Blessed and holy is, uh, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is a hope that we all share in this room. To be made part of that family, to be part of the chosen people of God, and to reign with Christ when he's built that temple, and he is our king during the millennial reign. And then in Revelation 21, 3 and 22, we hit our ultimate goal. Because during the millennial reign, God's spirit, we just read it, his glory dwells within the kingdom, and that's how he's living with us. I don't know about you, but my goal is to live with God in form, in person. Shane says it every single time he prays, see God face to face. And it is a brilliant reminder that that's our goal, to see God face to face. And be told, well done. Thou, good, thou faithful sir, dang it, butchered that part. It was going to be good, guys. It was going to be good. So, <laughs> Revelation 21, 3 and 22. Uh, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, or the house of God, or the dwelling place of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. I saw no temple. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. 
We look forward to a day where there is no house of the Lord because the world is the house of the Lord. This world is his chosen house. His people are his chosen people. And I really hope that we're there. Let's have a song. Gracious Lord, Father in heaven, we are incredibly grateful to you for the words that you have given us, for the ability to listen to your words and your spirit and study those things and learn more about you. We pray, God, that you would allow us to take everything that we learn from your words and apply it to our lives, that we might be better examples of what it means to serve you to the world around us. We pray for those who could not or would not be here today. We ask that you guide and direct all of us as we work through our lives here in this world. We pray, Lord, most of all, that we could be found worthy of a place in your kingdom when your son brings it to this earth and that when you live here with your chosen people, we might be among that group and see you face to face. We pray all these things and your son's name, and if they be your will, amen. <laughs>